Hello, I'm Tina Burton. I'm uh, in a resident in the neurology program and just finished a neuro-ophthalmology rotation about a couple weeks ago. Um, so I'm going to just talk about a case that we had uh, in clinic there. And it was a case of optic neuropathy in a gentleman with uh, atrial fibrillation. <coughs> so I'll be going over the case, uh, all of the ancillary testing that we did, um, the differential diagnosis, treatment, and then con some conclusions and discussion about uh, the optic neuropathy. So uh, this was a gentleman who was 58 years old. Uh, about a month prior to coming to us, he had had sort of this clouding of vision. He described it in his right eye as feeling like uh, his lens and his glasses were was uh, just cloudy, and he kept like he would want to wipe it. And then he had sudden uh, right eye vision loss, uh, and then and also developed a retroorbital headache. Uh, but initially, his first symptoms were painless. He has a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, obstructive sleep apnea, and uh, was recently diagnosed with atrial fibrillation about six months prior uh, during a just a routine workup for a sinus surgery. He was started on um, amiodarone and rivaroxaban at that time for stroke prophylaxis. So for his visual complaints, he went to his ophthalmologist about a, uh, two weeks prior to seeing us. Um, he had again, the mild clouding of vision in his right eye and the right-sided uh, pain and uh, vision, it more acute vision loss that had worsened. And when he was seen by the ophthalmologist, he had an inferior nasal visual field uh, deficit and he was also seeing stars in the right side of his vision, uh, not in the left eye. And he noticed a green hue around everything in the dark. And on his uh, fundoscopic examination, he, he had some disc edema at that time. So recent medical history, we talked a little bit about that. Uh, other medications he's on is levothyroxine, ibuprofen, Vitorin, omeprazole, fish oil, and a multivitamin. Family history is significant for hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and heart disease. And um, he occasionally smokes a cigar maybe once or twice a month, and then has two to three alcoholic beverages a week. On examination, his, he was hypertensive despite being on uh, therapy for that. Um, his blood pressure was 134 over 70. His acuity in the right eye was 20-25, and the left eye was 20-40 uh, with corrective lenses on. His uh, pupils were equal and reactive, but he did have uh, a right APD, uh, 0.6 log. His visual fields, uh, he continued to have that nasal and inferior arcuate defect. Um, and then uh, his left side was completely normal. His motility was full. His uh, color um, vision was uh, full in both eyes. And he just had a little bit of trouble with his stereopsis uh, in uh, circles. His anterior seg segments were clear and quiet. And he had a little bit of a cornea uh, verticillata in his uh, in both eyes, and then his interocular pressure was normal at 18. On fundoscopic examination, um, he had altitudinal uh, optic disc edema, and he also did have some hemorrhage, and then uh, also a very small cup to disc ratio of 0 0.1 in the right eye, the affected eye, and then in the left eye he had uh, a small small on the small side. Uh, with a cup to disc ratio of 0.2. His flicker fusion was normal. And then his labs were, were significant for a normal ESR and CRP. Uh, lipid panel um, was uh, ordered, and he said he was currently on a statin and that it was his lipids were controlled with that. And an A1C was also ordered because of his family history of diabetes um, and his uh, uh, body habitus. So we did Humphrey vis visual fields on him. Um, this, sh this just shows, shows that nasal and inferior arcuate defect. So the key features of his presentation were that initially his uh, vision loss was painless. Uh, he did develop that headache a little later on, um, but uh, he had unilateral um, vision, vision problems, but he also had small cup to disc ratios bilaterally. He had normal inflammatory markers um, and we'll talk about why that's significant in a minute. And uh, no trauma to the area, no UTOS type phenomenon. Uh, 
He had a normal neurological examination otherwise, and his risk factors were hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and obstructive sleep apnea as far as we knew at this point in time. And uh, he also uh, had recently started amiodarone it's about six months prior. So the differential on him uh, was for an optic neuropathy. And you'll see here highlighted that um, his was more rapid in onset. And uh, the most compelling uh, reason would be a toxic or ischemic optic neuropathy given his set of symptoms. So I'll talk a little bit about amiodarone-induced amiodarone optic neuropathy, so, um, which is what we determined this gentleman had. Uh, he has uh, an NAION, actually. So his onset was within this window of 4 to 12 months of initiation of amiodarone therapy. His was 6 months. Um, pathophysiology, so it's not entirely known. Uh, however, they do find that on uh, dissection of all of the intraocular tissues, including the optic nerve, that they do have uh, some infiltration um, of uh, deposits. And then also, uh, they don't know whether there's actually, it, the amiodarone is a direct toxic effect um, that causes the vision loss, um, or whether it just increases the, um, it's something that sort of tips someone over the edge that has risk factors for developing NAION. So some people call this a variant of NAION with um, slow resolution of the optic disc edema. Other people uh, um, in papers have discussed that, like I said, there was this independent risk factor um, for NAION in initially, and then you add amiodarone on, and, it, and it, then it develops. And then another... Uh, pathophysiology that was uh, addressed was, uh, there was a, a paper where they said that, um, in fact, NAION was not attributed to amiodarone therapy as far as they were concerned, that they felt that typically these, uh, these folks have risk factors for NAION independent of amiodarone, and that it's just sort of an incidental uh, finding on physical, or on, a, on the history. So if we look at our patient, and we try to tease out whether this is uh, what they would call an amiodarone optic neuropathy or whether this is NAION, he sort of falls a little bit into both categories. Um, so his onset was within 12 months. He's male. Um, so those are the things that are sort of predominantly found in the amiodarone-induced optic neuropathy. But then his other issues are that he has a small cup-to-disc ratio. Um, obviously, the one, uh, it's 0.1 in his affected eye, but he did have a small uh, cup to disc ratio bilaterally, which would, one would think would preclude him to this in both eyes. Um, and then uh, systemic manifestations of the amiodarone, he was not have any, having any sort of other systemic uh, um, uh, sequela of uh, starting that therapy. We did not do a tap on him, but sometimes you can find that the uh, ICP is raised in amiodarone-induced um, optic neuropathy. And uh, they also noticed that, noted that it, the resolution of the disc edema is often much more prolonged uh, in amiodarone-induced optic neuropathy. <coughs> so our treatment for this gentleman was to, first of all, stop the amiodarone, which was, uh, we think, either the inciting uh, reason or, like, like I said in the discussion, some people would argue that he may have developed NAION, <coughs> NAION independently. And then we screened for uh, additional risk factors. So the A1C, uh, we know he has hyperlipidemia, but we wanted to see if his lipids were actually being treated properly. And then he also, also had hypertension, uh, even in the examination room. And so we, wanted, we spoke to him about making sure that he was dosing his medications in the morning rather than the evening to try to reduce the risk of nocturnal uh, hypotensive uh, episodes that could cause this as well, um, and also to get a good handle on his blood pressure. Um, we did recommend that he could try some bromonidine, uh, which has been shown to be somewhat helpful in some people, but no significant difference uh, in uh, randomized controlled trials. Um, but the side effect profile is so low that uh, we thought it was worth trying. Um, other things that have been studied, oral steroids, plus or minus whether those are helpful at all, 
uh, optic nerve decompression. There was a big trial on that, and uh, it was found to be actually detrimental. And then um, anti-VEGF uh, injected intra uh, vitreal uh, is also a therapy that's questionably uh, helpful. Um, but we did not suggest any of those latter three uh, because some of them are actually detrimental. So, so conclusions are that uh, amiodarone, just always think of someone who comes into your office with atrial fibrillation um, or on amiodarone therapy that, uh, to ask about amiodarone therapy because it does put someone at risk for developing NAION or a toxic neuropathy. Um, and then to also remember that uh, in trying to tease out whether it is NAION or the amiodarone optic neuropathy, just some of the major um, things that they found uh, just looking back on chart review. Uh, males are typically more affected. It can be bilateral and unilateral. You can have an elevated ICP, um, and then you can also look for systemic uh, drug side effects that would sort of tip you off to the fact that um, it's affecting uh, the patient in multiple uh, uh, organ systems. So, and then also to look at the um, period of recovery once you identify the problem and assist in treatment of it. The uh, optic disc edema should resolve within one to eight months, uh, but in a, a true NAION, that can uh, resolve a lot faster. Um, and then also to just rem remind yourself and your patients that even though they stop the amiodarone therapy, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to stop the disease progression. Um, it obviously can help, but the, the about 10% of your patients will continue to worsen even after stopping therapy. Part of this is due to the fact that amiodarone has such a, a long half-life um, and sticks around for quite a while even though they've stopped the therapy. So, And then just remember to screen for other risk factors. So uh, that's about it. Any questions? It's fine to just, uh, what I would do is just contact our cardiologist and let them know that you're stopping that medication, have them get seen right away and decide uh, what other uh, rhythm or rate controlling drugs they would prefer to, to put them on. Yeah? We did not do an MRI. Uh, his neurological <coughs> examination was so benign otherwise that we felt that it was not indicated at that time. All right, thanks. <laughs>